listening in on General Convention, presented by the National Council. The 57th Triennial General Convention of the Protestant Episcopal Church, Boston, 1952, opened on a Sunday evening with a great service of worship in Boston Garden. 17,000 worshipers witnessed the solemn procession of over 3,000 choir members, deputies, officers and members of the National Council, delegates to the Women's Auxiliary Triennial Meeting, distinguished representatives of other churches, and the bishops of the church. 6,000 more milled around outside, unable to get in. The giant red docile with a large golden cross hanging in the center was the focal point for all. As the long procession ended, the presiding bishop of the church in Japan, His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury, the former presiding bishop, and the presiding bishop ascended to their seats close by the altar, and the congregation rose and sang. opening hymn, the service of evening prayer from the Book of Common Prayer was conducted by the Right Reverend Edwin A. Penick, Bishop of the Diocese of North Carolina. O Lord, open thou our lips. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Praise ye the Lord. General Confession, the Absolution, and the Lord's Prayer, the minister and congregation read Psalm 145 responsively, listened to the lessons from Isaiah 55 and Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, and then stood and joined together in making their common declaration of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church, that thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth and all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. 
for the sake of him who died and rose again, and ever liveth to make intercession for us, Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Following the prayers and thanksgiving and the singing of the hymn, the sermon was preached by the presiding bishop, the Right Reverend Henry Knox Sherrill. For oh, we are laborers together with God. Tonight we are met for the opening service of the 57th Triennial Convention of our Church. We are a representative assembly being chosen as members of this general convention by the constitutional processes set forth in our church law. The basis of our church life is that we are members one of another. Of course, there are inevitably differences of opinion as we try to gain the whole truth. What I am asking is that these be met here and elsewhere in the consciousness that we are bound together in a common life as by hoops of steel and that we are fellow laborers together with God and that therefore in and through discussion of our differences, he will make his will known if we humbly keep in mind our dependence upon him. The church is inevitably involved in the problems and perplexities of the times in which we live. We cannot attempt to live in some ivory tower remote from life. If there ever was a time when it is essential to place first things first, it is now. We live in a world in which hatred, suspicion, struggle for power and personal advantage are rampant. It is a world divided against itself. In such a situation, what has the church not alone to say, but to give? Christ taught of loving kindness, forgiveness, humility, and a ministry to others. Are these qualities inherent in us? We talk of the fellowship of the church, and we are divided. Will anyone be bold enough to claim that the evils which so afflict humanity are not evident in us? No wonder that those outside the church so often state as they hear the majestic claims and noble exhortations of the gospel, physician, heal thyself. If the salt have lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? No conventional, nominal Christianity is sufficient in these days. The essence of the gospel is love. In all the strength and power of that often abused word, let the church reveal this quality in our relationship one with another. In the bearing of burden, in the care of human soul, in an outreach to men and women everywhere, 
let us be a true fellowship in Christ, then and only then shall we perform the task committed to us by Christ. We are fellow laborers together with God, the God who so loved the world. The offering went to the presiding bishop's fund for world relief. The offertory anthems were sung by the massed choirs of the parishes in the Boston area under the direction of Everett Titcombe. was spoken by the Right Reverend St. George Tucker, former presiding bishop. Let us pray. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest, and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Processional hymns were sung, the service was over, and the organ and brass choirs covered up the departure of the congregation. So the 57th General Convention began with this colorful service of worship on the first Sunday evening in September 1952. You are listening in on General Convention. opening service of the 57th General Convention of the Protestant Episcopal Church, Boston, 1952, with the fine music of the massed choirs, gave an inspiring mood to the entire convention. You are listening in on General Convention. Monday morning, after a corporate communion of the clerical and lay deputies and bishops, the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies were called to order. The House will be in order. 
The House will be in order. The Secretary will the now read the House of Deputies proceeded immediately to call the roll and elect a president. Nominations are now in order for the president of this House. I recognize the nominating and seconding Louisiana speeches were made. The vote was taken. The president of the House of Deputies was elected and escorted to the platform. In accepting this high post of honor for the second time, the very Reverend Claude de Bisprouse addressed the House. You will know how very much I appreciate the honor which you've just bestowed on me. I'm sure that all of us together will be constantly conscious that we are brethren meeting together with one great job, and that is to try and help push this world a little bit nearer to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And by something that we may do here and in our prayers, that we may help to bring peace to this troubled world. Tragedy struck early at the, the convention. Order of business, I believe, Immediately after announcing the election, the election of Dr. C. Rankin Barnes as secretary of the convention, Dean Sprouse dropped dead on the stage, and prayers were offered in both houses. Remember thy servant, O Lord, in according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people, and grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. business of the convention had to go on, but Tuesday morning both houses were organized and underway, with the Reverend Dr. Theodore Otto Waddell, warden of the College of Preachers, Washington, D.C., elected to succeed Dean Sprouse as president of the House of Deputies. Dr. Waddell made a brief speech of acceptance and turned immediately to business. Mr. President, in accordance with... The mountain of business piled higher and higher Our with every resolution, residents. memorial, and report of committee and commission. All day, morning, and afternoon, both houses labored, mainly over routine matters in the early sessions. The familiar gavel sounds of the presiding officers and the rare good humor, and the oft-repeated phrase, resolved, the, the House of Bishops or the House of Deputies concurring, kept sounding over and over as the business unfolded. Both houses came together each day for the noonday service of worship, conducted during the first week by the Reverend Theodore P. Ferris, rector of Trinity Church, Boston. through the story of Jesus, there is the constant movement from the multitude to solitude, from intense activity to quietness and passivity. That's the reason I think that we feel that in the midst of this important activity of ours, it is essential that we take time to be quiet. Prayer is, in one sense, stopping to think about God. The purpose of prayer, as most of us know well, is not to get something, but to be with someone. Prayer always begins with praise. As an act of praise, let us say the Venite. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. 
let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Symphony Hall, where the deputies met, and Horticultural Hall, where the bishops met, were just across Massachusetts Avenue from each other, and visitors flocked into both halls, flowed around the corridors looking at the exhibits, and made merry bustle all the day long. But when some special order of business was announced, or some distinguished speaker was scheduled, everyone tried to squeeze into Symphony Hall Auditorium like when the presiding bishop called to order the first joint session of both houses and the woman's auxiliary to hear the report of the National Council and its program for the coming triennium. It is the privilege of the National Council to make a report of its work and activities and program to this joint session. I present, first of all, the very efficient and the greatly beloved treasurer of the National Council to make his report, Mr. Harry Adensell. We hope you will see fit to adopt the budget that will be suggested for the next three years, and then will provide us with the money, all the money, so that we will have the necessary tools to carry out the work in accordance with your mandate. I now come to the presentation of the program of the Home Department. A report from the Home Department can be little more than a digest of our missionary activity in continental United States. It involves a bird's eye view of those fields in which the several divisions of the department operate. George A. Wheeland, who told of the work of the Home Department, retires at the end of the year after a long, successful term of service. Under his fine executive leadership, the programs of the many divisions have grown and expanded. Town and country, with its rural program, especially at Roan Ridge, Missouri, the progress made in racial work, the close tie through the chaplains with the armed forces, and one of the greatest of all modern mission fields, the college campus, attest to the great zeal and devotion of this large department. The Right Reverend Norman B. Nash, Bishop of the Host Diocese of Massachusetts, introduced the work of the Department of Christian Education. Today we report progress in the development of our church's new program of Christian education so conceived. We have been much criticized for the slowness of the production of material. But I have lived long enough to see the production of many materials and to see their very partial use and their obsolescence. As you will learn, a definite production program, a timetable has been adopted and the staff is hard at work so that by the end of this triennium a very large part of the teaching materials our church schools need will be at use throughout the church. The wonderful progress in this whole field of Christian education was told in an unusual and effective manner by the several divisions of children's work, youth work, curriculum development, leadership training, and audiovisual education. The Right Reverend Carl Morgan Block, Bishop of California, presented the great work of world relief and church cooperation. The high point of his report was the presentation of a displaced family. Displaced persons is incarnate in the next speaker and the charming children who will accompany her. Mrs. Starkis is a displaced person from Latvia. Bishop Sherrill and friends. Before the Second World War, our family lived in Latvia, which was once the little... The Right Reverend John Bentley, head of the Overseas Department, presented his own report. The Overseas Department is responsible for the unification, development, and prosecution of the missionary, educational, and social work of the Church in those areas which lie beyond our own borders. After presenting his report, he introduced each missionary bishop who gave a brief report of the work in his own field. The Right Reverend Stephen E. Keeler, Bishop of the Diocese of Minnesota, introduced the work of Christian social relations. To state it all in words that the average churchman may understand, it means our participation in child welfare, the care of the aged, 
hospitals and clinics, in casework agencies, and the resettlement of displaced persons. It means continuing activity about civil liberties and the tensions and inequalities between people of different social, cultural, and religious backgrounds. At the close of his report, Bishop Keeler introduced Mrs. Theodore O. Widell. Our social, economic, and political lives will be judged by the same standards and by the same holy God. May we then, as a church and as Christian people, really learn and act. Now you have heard reports from all of the departments, and I will not try to summarize those. I should like to make a comment upon world relief and church cooperation. I hope the time will never come when we will build our budget for getting human suffering and misery throughout the world and remembering only partisan ecclesiastical considerations. Secondly, I hope the time will never come, particularly in the condition of our world, that we fail to play without loss of our own great tradition and background, our part in the cooperative Christianity of the world and of the United States. The 57th General Convention continued its first week in session, and those who came to Boston began to feel at home, and the work of the church by its duly elected representatives went on. You are listening in on General Convention.